Hello, welcome again to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and our program comes to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Uh, our program today will uh, center on an area of GI pathology that's sometimes challenging, uh, that of uh, gastric polyps. Uh, as I mentioned, our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, sponsored by the Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Um, and our patient that sort of st started this uh, consideration is a 58-year-old man who has a, an exophytic uh, gastric mass uh, in the antrum, uh, partially obstructing uh, the outlet there. Uh, and actually, there are uh, several uh, fairly uh, bulky masses. So uh, endoscopically, uh, let's think about this. Uh, there are a variety of histologic types that, of polyps that can occur in the uh, stomach. Um, most commonly, we've seen the fundic gland polyp, uh, which typically is small and maybe multiple, uh, has some association with familial adenomatous polyposis and so forth. Uh, conventional adenoma uh, with, of course, dysplasia, hyperplastic uh, polyps, most usually foveolar type, uh, inflammatory polyps, oxyntic gland, pyloric gland, and then several polyp types that are associated with syndromes, such as uh, Cowden's polyps, we won't touch on those today, Putz Jaeger's polyps, juvenile polyps, and Cronkite Canada polyps. Uh, I've marked with an asterisk here in red the ones that are associated with dysplasia quite frequently um, and have uh, a elevated risk of subsequent carcinoma. The ones in blue, uh, may occasionally have dysplasia, but there's much less rare um, and a much lower uh, likelihood uh, of uh, progressing to uh, carcinoma. So let's look at the case today. And here we see uh, a rather bulky polyp. Uh, as we can see, there's a bit of edema, there's some dilated glands, and there's also this sort of uh, arborizing uh, pattern of glands uh, in different areas uh, and some fairly dense uh, uh, epithelial islands. Uh, we have a bit of vascularized stroma, um, and as we look at that, it looks rather pink. However, uh, we don't see a definite uh, smooth muscle uh, traversing this process. It's not lobulated in that sense. There is some inflammation here, as we can see in this very edematous uh, stroma uh, and in some of the glands. Uh, looking at these uh, uh, glandular elements, they look to be a uh, fairly uh, uniform cell type. Uh, here on the surface, we see sort of foveolar type cells. Um, and that also is what is uh, present in many of our deeper portions uh, of this lesion as we see down here. Um, so we'll uh, say that we're looking at a foveolar type of uh, epithelium. We're seeing um, an inflamed and edematous stroma without too much in the way of smooth muscle. Uh, so let's go and look at some of these areas that are more uh, cellular and maybe a little bit bluer uh, to see if we have evidence here of dysplasia. And when we look for dysplasia in these lesions, we're looking for things that resemble dysplasias that we see elsewhere in the uh, glandular epithelium of the GI tract. Um, so we're looking for uh, nuclear crowding, hyperchromasia, loss of polarity, uh, those kinds of features. Uh, to give us a clue that we may have um, dysplasia present. We'll go down here a little bit lower here and uh, take a look here at this nice uh, dot here that uh, my colleague has provided for us. Uh, and here we can see one of the hallmarks of dysplasia, which is architectural complexity. Uh, so here we see crowding, uh, we see uh, loss of uh, adhesion to the uh, basal lamina, um, and uh, some, certainly some hyperchromasia in these uh, cells as well. Uh, here's another gland over here where we begin to get uh, cribriform type formations. And so uh, these type of foci uh, would qualify uh, for dysplasia uh, in this lesion. Um, and as we can look a little bit further, we may see there's more of these areas. Uh, I believe we had some more up in here that uh, was also uh, highlighted as uh, potentially showing a higher degree of uh, cytologic atypia. And here we see some more of that loss of polarity uh, that I was talking about with a little bit more hyperchromasia and crowding of the nuclei. Uh, this would be still fairly low-grade dysplasia, uh, 
um, but uh, certainly not uh, the typical foveolar type of epithelium that we would usually want to see to qualify this as a uh, simple hyperplastic polyp. Now you'll notice here we begin to get a little bit of a suggestion of uh, a blue uh, goblet cell type uh, differentiation. Uh, so sometimes the setting for these polyps is the setting of uh, of uh, atrophic chronic gastritis, and so that's a consideration in terms of the background. Um, we'll look at another slide here on this same patient, uh, just to sort of reinforce these same things. And so here we see the adjacent mucosa um, and this uh, the full architecture of the polyp. We see that here there are some of these dilated glands, but we're not seeing any arborizing muscle. Uh, and in this particular uh, section, uh, we don't have much to suggest dysplasia, maybe a little bit uh, of a hyperchromasia here uh, with some stratification. So uh, just sort of low grade uh, type of dysplasia, no uh, significant architectural features of dysplasia. Uh, here in the adjacent mucosa, we can see some dilated deep glands. Uh, but basically it looks to be normal uh, gastric uh, fundic type mucosa. Uh, another section here uh, from this same case, uh, again, showing this uh, complex arborizing, or excuse me, a complex dilated glandular uh, structure with a lot of edema uh, and areas as we've uh, noted here uh, with a more crowded uh, epithelial component uh, manifesting hyperchromasia, um, a little bit of sort of intestinal type uh, differentiation. Um, and as we can see here, some low grade dysplasia with mitotic figures, uh, nuclear uh, enlargement and hyperchromasia uh, as we've indicated. Well, uh, so let's uh, think about how we wanna differentiate gastric polyps and what criteria we may be looking for. Um, there are, uh, the, I listed here the more common types, the fundi gland, the traditional adenoma, hyperplastic, inflammatory polyps, the putz jaggers and juvenile polyps, with occur, which occur with some frequency, pyloric gland polyps, uh, and then Canada cron cronkite syndrome polyps, which are not common, but it's good to know about. Um, and I think there are several features that can be helpful in differentiating these, although you see there's a considerable amount of overlap um, as well as uh, the amount and relative risk of dysplasia in each of these is a little bit different. But I think thinking about uh, factors like uh, uh, the nature of the stroma, uh, certainly with an adenoma or with hyperplastic polyps and some of the inflammatory polyps, you're much more likely to get a very edematous stroma, a little bit less so with juvenile polyps. Uh, dilated glands are most prominent perhaps in the juvenile polyps, but we see them in cases like the one we just looked at, as well as in some other uh, lesions. And of course, in fundi gland polyps, uh, we see that as well. Um, arborizing smooth muscle, characteristic feature of putz jaggers polyps. And then the degree of inflammation that may be present also uh, most pronounced in inflammatory polyps, but can be seen to some degree in several of the other types of polyps. So uh, in terms of hyperplastic polyps, uh, as I've mentioned, this is foveolar type of epithelial uh, that uh, occurs in sort of dilated glandular spaces with distorted architectural patterns. Uh, there's usually edema and vascular congestion and a variable amount of inflammation with uh, sparse smooth muscle as we saw. Uh, and as uh, in our case, the patients may experience some degree of obstruction uh, if these occur either near the outlet or the inlet. Um, important to note that dysplasia can be present in up to 10%, um, and carcinoma eventually develops in uh, well, prep 0.9, 1% of these patients. Uh, if we're thinking of uh, multiple lesions uh, in this situation, you want to make sure you rule out uh, these other entities, put Jaeger's polyps, familial adenomatous polyposis, and juvenile polyposis, which more typically uh, occur as multiple lesions. So I thought to make our discussion a little bit more uh, interesting, and particularly if you're able to come back and study the slides, I just show you some quick examples of these other types of polyps. So here's a, a nice polyp with dilated glands. Uh, but as we look here, we see that the mucosal uh, origin here is fundic type mucosa. And the key giveaway here is as we look at these uh, dilated glandular spaces, uh, we see parietal cells. 
so these are uh, funded gland origin. Uh, now, typically you will have foveolar uh, epithelium admixed with these uh, lesions. And so that shouldn't surprise you nor trick you into thinking this is a hyperplastic polyp. Uh, but dilated glands with uh, uh, parietal cells, plus or minus chief cells, and admixed uh, foveolar epithelium should signal a uh, fundic gland. And now occasionally, uh, as we look here, we can get uh, fundic gland type polyps uh, with a more, so here's the uh, characteristic dilated glands with uh, uh, fundic type of uh, glandular epithelium. Here is our admixed foveolar component. Uh, and uh, this begins to show a mild degree of dysplasia. As you see here, we get some stratification um, and a little bit of nuclear crowding um, and hyperchromasia. If we compare that to what the normal foveolar epithelium should look like in these next door, you can see the difference. Here, here is the slightly dysplastic, here is the normal foveolar epithelium. So that's a very helpful uh, thing to compare if you've got both of those elements present. Um, now, of course, here we can also see that it comes out near to the surface of these glands and you begin to get architectural complexity with this. This is not high grade dysplasia, it's still a very low grade dysplasia. So uh, next we'll take a look at um, a conventional adenoma. Um, and obviously these are just very small superficial biopsies. Um, and we'll just focus here on one area uh, where uh, there's a small polyp uh, and a dysplasia. And these are typically more the intestinal type of adenomas uh, that have uh, nice uh, features that we would associate with a tubular adenoma uh, in the colon or duodenum uh, with pseudostratification, crowding of the nuclei, a little bit of architectural complexity, uh, hyperchromasia, and variable uh, loss of polarity, um, and standing out and aside and different from uh, the adjacent normal foveolar epithelium. So it's a little bit subtle, it's small, uh, and, and obviously larger variants can exist, but uh, when you see this, you should be thinking of uh, traditional uh, gastric adenoma. Uh, here's another polyp, uh, maybe a little bit similar to our incident case here, which where we see a dilated glandular uh, spaces and edematous stroma, uh, somewhat smooth contour and variable uh, spaces here. Um, but uh, in this situation, um, we're looking at much less inflammation. Uh, we don't see any smooth muscle. Um, and this degree of uh, glandular dilatation and so forth uh, without the extensive uh, uh, changes that we uh, noted elsewhere, uh, particularly with a very pronounced dilatation of the glands, should be more likely to suggest to us a juvenile type polyp. Um, and so this is an example of a juvenile polyp and a little bit of a subtle distinction from that hyperplastic polyp that we just uh, looked at a few moments ago. Uh, here's another example of a gastric polyp. Uh, here we see a different pattern, very cellular, a little bit of glandular dilatation in some of these areas. Um, and as we look at uh, this uh, epithelium here and noting that the, we have a lot of these sort of small glands uh, that look very reminiscent of the uh, uh, pyloric or uh, mucinous glands of the antrum. Uh, this is a pyloric gland adenoma um, and has the features that we would associate with that with this very uh, typical uh, pyloric type epithelium. But again, notice that we can have some admixed uh, foveolar type epithelium uh, in these lesions. Um, again, you need to be concerned about dysplasia possibly in these, so they bear full examination and full consideration. Uh, the cellularity in this lesion is fairly typical um, as opposed to uh, what we saw with the hyperplastic lesion, which was less cellular and had more stroma relative to the glandular component. Uh, finally, uh, this is a biopsy taken from a patient uh, with Cronkite Candidus syndrome. Um, and as we look here, we see there is 
uh, not really good polyp formation, but there is certainly some foveolar epithelium, there's some dilatation, uh, and a little bit of a polypoid suggestion uh, in this lesion. Uh, the gastric component in Cronkite Canada syndrome is not the most prominent uh, feature, uh, but I'll show you here a polyp from the colon, uh, which shows this uh, much more nicely. Uh, let's turn it over here so we can look at it right side up. Um, and you can see these uh, elongated, dilated uh, uh, glandular spaces, usually in the sort of deeper portion of the mucosa with a variable amount of edematous uh, mucosal stroma around them. Um, and so this, uh, not specific histologic features, uh, but in conjunction with other features of the Cronkite Canada syndrome uh, should raise that possibility uh, for you. And this would be uh, typical of uh, the intestinal findings uh, with Cronkite Canada syndrome uh, type uh, mucosa. Well, that's a quick run through on those lesions to help you get a flavor for that. Uh, we'll finish up here with uh, one last uh, polyp uh, coming back to revisit the hyperplastic polyp. Um, and here we see again, um, a loose edematous stroma, uh, a little bit of proliferation, winding and tortuous uh, glands, maybe with a little bit of uh, uh, intestinal metaplasia as we see here. Uh, maybe even some paneth cells in there, um, and uh, the possibility of a little bit of dysplasia. Uh, if we look and see areas that look a little bit more hyperchromatic uh, and concerning for um, architectural or cytologic atypia. Uh, so this is uh, coming back to our uh, hyperplastic polyp, uh, a different patient uh, than our incident patient here. Uh, but again, highlighting the uh, contours and the uh, architectural features of this uh, that uh, can be helpful. So our final di sign-out diagnosis is a hyperplastic foveolar type polyp with areas of dysplasia. Um, and certainly that will uh, prompt uh, some early follow-up and evaluation of this patient. So thank you so much for joining us on this romp through uh, a number of uh, gastro gastric polyps. Uh, if you have uh, questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always open to those ideas and thoughts you may have. Uh, and uh, also hit that subscribe button so that you'll uh, catch future releases from our channel. It's been a pleasure to have you on our program today. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to being together with you again soon. Uh, and so until next time, thanks so much for joining me.